YouTube, hi, this is Anthony Michels calling from the Netherlands and I would like to talk a little bit about my talent system um, which is a, a, a new architecture for the development of complementary currencies and complementary currencies as we know are very hot at the moment because um, people are fed up with the banks and uh, with deflation and also more and more with usury itself and with uh, all the speculation that we have in the current monetary system. So. We're looking for improvements and monetary reform and uh, complementary currencies are really a huge part of that because, okay, we want national monetary reform, we want an interest-free credit-based or uh, at any rate uh, a usury-free monetary system on a national level and we all know that this is not going to happen anytime soon. So um, we've got to push in the market and this is very well doable. But uh, as we have been discussing earlier in, in several articles on my website, realcurrencies.wordpress.com, current architectures are basically insufficient to, uh, to meet all the challenges that these complementary units will, uh, will meet in the, in the market. And what I would like to do today is first discuss what problems these units face and uh, what they are supposed to solve. Uh, and then I would like to discuss three basic monetary architectures that currently hold sway, uh, Bitcoin, Euro or dollar backed units and mutual credit based units and then uh, talk a little bit about their uh, their architecture, how they create money, uh, what their good points are, their weaker points are and uh, then move on to the talent and uh, show why the talent is indeed a major improvement and uh, very perhaps hopefully an important step forward in well the struggle against the banks because that's what it's all about. Okay. Um, what are complementary units supposed to solve? Well, um, on my website I have discussed many monetary reform proposals and you can find them in the interest-free um, interest economics page on my website. I'll leave the links in, uh, below this bit when I'm done. Um, the basic issue with our current monetary system is that if you have money, you get more of it. That is that is basically uh, the main problem. The controllers of the system are the very richest people in the world. They own trillions. Uh, through usury, this grows with 5% each year, and uh, they already have billions and trillions, so they don't need this money. The, uh, the many of the world that actually work for, the, for a living, they, uh, they provide them with this income, and we don't need that. And... Um, what we are looking for is a monetary system that allows equitable exchange between free market players, just producers and workers in the economy and the state also, if, uh, if we choose to, to keep that up. And um, uh, the producers of the money or holders of money should not get richer simply by controlling the monetary system or having a lot of money. We want neutral exchange a monetary system that does not redistribute from the many to the few, or even from the uh, from the few to the many. The monetary system is also not a handout for the poor. No, it should be neutral, so that people who work uh, can market their products and services or their labor and get full value without being fleeced through usury and deflation, scarce money, because these are the main issues. Eh? Usury is, 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 a, is a top issue. Deflation is, is and, and scarce money. These two things are as bad as usury is, and uh, then you have all sorts of other nasty games, speculation and derivatives and blah, blah, blah. But uh, usury and scarce money and, the, and, and also the, the manipulation of the volume of money, so first inflation and then deflation, which, call, which causes the boom-bust cycle, these are the main issues with money. So we want, when we discuss monetary reform proposals, we look at whether these proposals actually solve the issues at hand. And um, so if we look at the monetary architectures of complementary currencies, we can, we can simply check whether they meet the needs, um, uh, meet the uh, criteria, whether they are interest free, whether they solve scarce money, uh, whether they redistribute, etc. And um, this then can be used to, 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 to see how good these, uh, these proposals uh, in, in, actually, in actuality are. So let us first discuss Bitcoin. Bitcoin is of course a huge experiment and I'm really elated it's out there because it's just showing to so many people that we can indeed create alternative currencies and that they can 
receive wide recognition and that they can uh, yeah, that, that they can actually be used by normal market players and um, it has made my own work a lot easier because when I'm now in the market talking about uh, complementary currencies, uh, I just have to say, just like Bitcoin, but then a little different because, uh, as we will see, uh, this, um, although Bitcoin is a, a huge success in terms of uh, media exposure, market capitalization, etc., from a monetary reform uh, uh, perspective, it's, a, it's basically a huge failure. And, and this is not surprising because it's based on Austrian economics and these Austrian economics, uh, we've been discussing this on, uh, on real currencies to a huge extent and it's all um, based on gold, Austrian economics. And uh, what they are proposing to end the current uh, ballooning of debt, etc., is to go to, uh, to migrate to a gold-based uh, currency. This is what Austrian economics wants us to do. And uh, they, they then say that uh, gold will prevent the banks from printing endless credit. This is not the case, but uh, this is what they say. And um, uh, the basic idea is that gold is intrinsically scarce. There's only a limited amount, in limited supply. They say about 150,000 tons uh, globally. This is rubbish also. There is way, 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 way more gold than that, but it's all in private hoards. And uh, gold is the same as diamonds. And we all know that Russia and the beers have, have so many diamonds that if they would bring them on the market, that, that the diamonds would immediately be uh, close to worthless. This is the same with gold. Bitcoin was designed in, uh, to, to behave like gold. In the first place, the money creation is mining. Okay, not putting a shovel into the ground, but uh, you have a computer program that solves algorithms. Um, after each bit, uh, after solving an algorithm, a new Bitcoin materializes in your uh, Bitcoin wallet, uh, and this process they call mining. And each algorithm is more complicated than the previous one, and uh, this means that uh, the more Bitcoin that are in circulation, the longer it takes to solve uh, solve the, uh, the new algorithms and the money supply grows very slowly in a more or less predictable way. This is a very um, primitive way of uh, money creation. Eh? This is basically, okay, this, it's the virtual way of doing it. Uh, this, this, but mining itself is, is thousands of years old. And um, the, base, the, the main drawback of it is that it is inflexible because the money supply cannot grow or shrink with the demand in the economy. It's just a set volume of money and... Uh, in theory, because in practice this is not the case, because those whole hoarding gold, they can at each at a moment's notice flood, flood the market, and then uh, with with with, with credit-based uh, gold land with gold lending, and then um, call in loans later. So, um, but theoretically the volume is stable, and uh, the problem of this is that economies grow. So if the economy grows and the money supply remains stable the relative amount of money in circulation shrinks, and this is deflationary. And deflation is really, next to usury, uh, one of the biggest redistributors of wealth because deflation makes money worth more, which is very nice if you have a lot of money. But it's very nasty if you are trying to um, make some money, for instance, by offering your labor. Because if money becomes worth more, wages go down. In, in monetary terms, and uh, so so deflation is grand for people who own trillions because their their trillions become worth more. It's very nasty for people who don't have money, and at this point, more than half of Americans have uh, zero assets or less. Uh, even the middle class is dwindling quickly, and uh, the middle class has also suffered big time on the deflation. Another problem of deflation, of course, is that debts become worth more in real terms, which is really very very nasty if you have. A whole globe drowning in debt. So deflation is really our worst nightmare. Deflation is what we suffer from nowadays in the real economy. And deflation is also what Bitcoin suffers from because uh, de a deflation manifests in the Bitcoin economy by a rising exchange rate. And while Bitcoin has been a little bit erratic, um, uh, the, the exchange rate uh, compared to the early days, it's, it's still at a huge level, at least 100 times uh, higher than it was three years ago. And this means that uh, Bitcoin is strongly deflationary, and deflation is also very. Uh, well, another problem with uh, uh, deflation is that it encourages hoarding, and hoarding is antithetical to spending money. And if we want a um, uh, good 
monetary system we wanted to circulate because money is in the first place a means of exchange and Bitcoin simply does not circulate it. It is being used to pay with very little, especially compared to each huge market capitalization, its turnover in the network is, is low. So um, it's a huge store of value. It's a wonderful speculative item. Uh, you can bet a little with it if you like, but it's not really very successful as a means of exchange. Another problem with Bitcoin, of course, is that, um, well, let me put it this way, what has been uh, healed, uh, Bitcoin has been healed because it is decentralized and uh, they say it's peer-to-peer -peer and there is no uh, central network management and this is true although we must also um, uh, notice that there are of course many organizations uh, Bitcoin uh, exchanges for instance that do have a major impact on the management of, uh, of the flow of Bitcoin and uh, this is then free market which is very much what the Austrian is like but it also invites cowboys and we have already seen the, uh, the implications of that but the main issue is that, okay, there is no central management, but there is huge centralization of wealth in Bitcoin. And this is automatic in a deflationary scenario, and it is also um, uh, part of uh, all the speculation that is going on in Bitcoin, because obviously the winners of the speculation, they get a lot of Bitcoin, and they win in these games. And what we have now today is that only a very few people hold most of the Bitcoins. And it is... In fairness, it's basically a Ponzi scheme and, and, and a few people at the top, uh, they own a lot of Bitcoin and every time new people join in, uh, the demand for the Bitcoin rises, its price rise and those, the early adapters or those who have cornered the market because the market is simply cornered, uh, they tend to gain most from uh, new people entering and therefore Bitcoin redistributes because new people entering the Bitcoin market, they bring in new uh, dollars, these dollars are um, acquired by those with a lot of Bitcoin by selling Bitcoin. And um, this, this is simply wealth redistribution uh, going on in the monetary system. And indeed, a few people, a few early adapters have become very wealthy with Bitcoin. And, and this is exactly what we don't want to see. We don't want people simply getting rich by playing games with money. No, we want a good means of exchange where we can exchange goods and services. Simply speculating and then becoming rich is not what we are looking for in a decent monetary system. So Bitcoin, huge success, um, a very nice adventure and a very lively community, which is, which is a real wonderful uh, part of Bitcoin. It's also uh, driven, of course, by a resistance against the banks, but unfortunately its architecture and its um, and its basic values, speculation, gaining money with money, these are big no-go's, so I'm, I'm not really too happy with uh, Bitcoin. Enough said. Uh, another huge architecture that we have in alternative currencies is uh, Euro or Dollar or British Pound back units. So uh, these are usually, usually used for um, regional currencies, what you have, uh, the Bristol Pound, in the United States, you have the Berkshires. Um, in Germany, you have the Kimgau. In Germany, you have dozens of them. And uh, how they work is very simple. The money creation process is this. They print notes, or the, the usually also uh, allow online um, banking, banking accounts. Um, and they sell one Berkshire, for instance. One Berkshire is one dollar. They sell a Berkshire for a dollar. Uh, they, take, they take in the dollar and the Berkshire starts circulating within the network of businesses that accept the Berkshire. And then when it uh, ends up with a business that cannot spend it in the network, he can come back to the issuing organization uh, to exchange the Berkshire back into dollar. After which the Berkshire is taken out of circulation. So the money creation process is simply selling them, uh, after which they are spent into circulation by the, by the purchaser. They all work the same in terms of uh, unit of account. They use the unit of account of the, uh, of the national currency. They always say one dollar is one Berkshire, or one euro is one Kimgauer, or one Bristol pound is one pound, uh, because this provides price transparency. And this is really very, uh, this is also a big bonus compared to, for instance, Bitcoin, which has a uh, fluctuating exchange rate. And this is, this is a little bit, um, complicating in daily payment traffic. So uh, um, 
and it is of course a part of the fact that Bitcoin is international and, uh, and the regional currencies are, are usually uh, used to uh, stimulate the, the local economy, the regional economy. So um, there is price transparency, one local unit is one euro or one dollar and uh, there is also convertibility which is a huge issue. Bitcoin is also convertible, big strength of Bitcoin. Um, but the problem with uh, with these alternate with this um, regional currency architecture is that there can only be so many uh, as many regional currencies in uh, regional units in circulation as they have dollars or euros in the bank because they are sold into circulation and these dollars or euros are needed to convert them back and they are uh, by the rules of the system. All the units in circulation are backed by a dollar or a euro, or a euro. and therefore um, it is a little bit uh, limited in terms of combating money scarcity because euro is scarce, dollar is scarce, and you need to sacrifice a dollar or a euro to acquire a, um, a local unit. So the, 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 the money supply in reality does not um, increase. And um, it does also not allow for interest-free credit because you cannot create more units and lend them out interest-free because you need euros or dollars to back them. So both money scarcity and usury are uh, and uh, interest-free credit are not part of uh, euro or dollar-backed or British pound-backed units. And this, in practice, this does show uh, in terms of turnover in the network because. Um, these units typically do not acquire huge broad support and, and, and usage and uh, this is probably because they simply are not effective enough in combating the main issues namely money scarcity and usury notwithstanding the fact that they have this great strength of convertibility which makes acceptance by businesses so much more easy um, the third architecture that holds sway and which is huge is, uh, is basically mutual credit. Mutual credit is simply double entry bookkeeping. Uh, what happens is that you get an account and you get a credit limit, so you, uh, you can go uh, so many into, into debt, so much into debt. After you start spending, the money starts circulating in the network. So this is how the money uh, is created. It's basically very similar to how the banks create money, but of course, the banks do it with uh, with interest and um, in bartering. Interest is not uncommon, far from it. Uh, it, it does happen often, but uh, if you are looking for a high-powered unit that is actually capable of providing interest-free credit and combating money scarcity, then interest, then mutual credit it can be done interest-free easily. Um, and it is a very very strong way of uh, of creating money because the great strength of is not only that it provides interest-free credit, but it also has very abundant money. There is never a shortage of money because you can always provide more credit and uh, money scarcity is never an issue in, uh, in a network with uh, mutual credit-based units. In the world, you have a number of huge barters at this point. In uh, Belgium, you have uh, the Res Euro. Um, it started about 10 years ago and they turn over I think about 100 million per year at this point, which is a, a good success. Um, in Switzerland, you have the Veer, which is the legendary example. They have been turning over billions for 80 years now, and they have a, about a billion in local spread at outstanding. It's not completely interest-free, which I don't like, but uh, it used to be. Uh, and um, Veer has, it has been so successful turning over billions per year, like I said, that uh, it is very likely that the bankers have been strong-arming Veer a little bit. And the, the rumor is uh, that they have been uh, subverting it slowly but surely and been telling them what you have now is grand, but don't start growing aggressively because um, we will have to respond. I'm not sure whether this is the case, but this is a rumor uh, anyway, and um, it's very likely because Veer could have gone much further, for instance, a huge downside of Rear is that they don't allow consumers in the network. So uh, it's only for business to business, and this is obviously a huge limitation if you're looking for big turnover. 
Um, and what you see with many of these barters, besides gas and where you have also commercial bartering, uh, you have literally, literally thousands of them all over the globe. Uh, and they um, and they can be very uh, the the goods the, the limitation of these barters is basically that they are being run for profit. They're basically simply commercial barters, and while they add value for their customers, they're typically also quite expensive. And um, this really limits broad acceptance. And uh, often they're also uh, purely business to business. Yes, is a big exception in Belgium. They they have both consumers and uh, and businesses, but rest is also quite expensive. Many of these barters come, for instance, with the transaction costs, which is very punitive in day-to-day uh, -day commercial traffic, and uh, which I think no complementary unit should um, should tax its users with, because I think complementary yeah, unit should be developed in such a way that they facilitate exchange and anything that in this exchange should be cut away. So the great strength of mutual credit is abundant money, interest-free credit, but the great downside is it is not convertible for euro or dollar, simply because there is no euro or dollar in the bank. The money is just being created by giving uh, businesses a credit limit and there is nothing to, uh, to convert uh, these units with. So what you get is that some of the businesses in the network will attract a lot of the units, more than they can viably spend in the network. And this is always a huge bottleneck, always in, uh, in these networks. And uh, it also hinders accept acceptance in the uh, early phases of the, uh, of the network. Because one basic challenge in, uh, in building up these networks is always how to get a substantial network that can, uh, because money is obviously dependent, the power of money is dependent on the number of users and this is always a huge challenge to get a, a big network with a lot of people and businesses accepting and, and paying with your unit. So, mutual credit, very strong proposition, but not convertible to euro. Next we have the talent. So the talent, uh, as we've been saying, does provide this crucial convertibility for mutual credit-based units, and that's why it's such a huge improvement. But it's not just convertibility. About the convertibility, it's very simply organized. We have uh, developed software that allows um, online trading in talent-based units. Um, for the rest, we use Cycle software. Cycle software was developed by uh, a think tank in the Netherlands, Stro, uh, a very uh, successful think tank, think tank in terms of monetary reform have been in the business for 40 years and, and Cycles is really very high-end software that uh, allows very subtle and uh, comprehensive configuration of, uh, of, of monetary uh, systems. Unfortunately, it does not allow an online uh, exchange for trading the unit, so we have developed that ourselves as an add-on. And uh, so the talent software is Cycles plus our own software um, uh, with the exchange and Mutual credit that is also convertible is really a breakthrough proposition because now we have, can create units that have abundant money, never, never again money scarcity, interest-free credit and convertibility to uh, euro or dollar, which is very important for, for the most successful businesses in the network. So a huge breakthrough and um, a very necessary um, to start competing with Euro because um, I think that um, to break through we, there are two critical success factors. You need to have good monetary architecture and professional management and, and the reason why uh, REST in Belgium and in Switzerland the WEIR have been so successful over the last years is simply because they have a fair, fairly good monetary architecture based on mutual credit especially in Switzerland, that, uh, that uh, double entry bookkeeping is simply how the money is created. The rest is slightly different, but it's in, in, the, same, in the same vein. But VIR is, uh, is, is a reasonable monetary system based on mutual credit, so interest-free credit, abundant money, but not uh, convertible, but combined with very professional management, and this has been uh, the reason why they've been so uh, successful over the last 80 years. With the, uh, the talent, we also add on 
the next level, namely convertibility. And in our best practices, we, we state very clearly professional management is a must. And uh, besides convertibility, we have a number of, of best practices in the, in the talent, um, which also strongly reinforce its chances of success. In the first place, zero transaction costs, like I was already saying. Transaction costs um, simply hinder exchange and therefore um, they should be avoided. Um, covering the costs for a talent-based system is not really too much of an issue and transaction costs are, are often used to, to, to create a business model for the issuing organization because obviously if you are going to work professionally, you must have a good business case uh, with income. Uh, in, in talent, this is in, in talent-based units. This is organised with um, with a small fee that businesses have to pay. So uh, we advised uh, ten talent units per month, where one talent is one euro or one dollar. So if it's if, if you're in America and, and, and plan on implementing such a scheme, it would be about thirteen dollars per month, or a certain talent per month. Because that's another very attractive proposition of a talent-based unit because it is convertible. The issuing organization can accept talent-based units uh, to cover its own costs. And uh, this, this increases credibility, but it also makes it even easier to pay for, uh, for the businesses. And 10 talent units per month is really very low cost. If it, it amounts to 120 per year. And, you know... Even basic banking costs amount to, uh, to such a sum, and that is even without usury, uh, without interest on any loans. But also if you compare it uh, to membership to a network organization or um, a business club, uh, it's, it's really very, very cheap. And um, the basic idea is that uh, to have a, a successful business as the issuing organization, a successful business, that's not really the, the correct uh, phrase because I propose and strongly promote uh, offering these units in a not-for-profit setting. I think that uh, the monetary system is should be exploited, should be not exploited, but uh, managed as a service to the community, a service that needs professional management. But um, since money is part of the commons, it should not be a money-making uh, racket. And if you do it for profit. It's so easy to make money with these networks if you're a good business, businessman that, um, that I think we would see uh, big risks of, of it becoming basically a, uh, a plunder operation again. So that's why I promote not-for-profit exploitation of the, of the organization and not the unit. Um, the problem is how to survive the initial stages. Um, if, if you have a thousand or more businesses paying per month, then you have a solid base from which you can build a bigger organization that, uh, that can stand the test of time. Um, a thousand participating businesses is about the minimum that you need to have a serious impact in the local economy, let alone a national economy. Small countries can, uh, can easily uh, use a, uh, a national-based unit you know, in the United States. I, I don't think it's really doable, it's just too big. But uh, there you could have a, a unit on a state level, for instance, or in a big city, because if you do it just in a, a city like Dallas, a city like Dallas turns over many, many billions per year, and uh, you can have a huge impact with, uh, with a city-based unit there, or in similar uh, size cities. But uh, the problem is how to get from, the, from, from zero to thousand on a, in, a, in a professional way. And so you need a, a bit of uh, startup capital, and that is, that, that is a bottleneck always, of course, how to get that funding. Uh, but uh, ultimately, this, uh, this kind of business is not for the faint-hearted. You need a, an entrepreneurial instinct and uh, organizational skills. And um, if you have a good business plan, it is possible to, uh, to acquire this money. And um, the focus in the development of the talent has been to keep costs as low as possible for all participants. But for consumers, it's, it's completely free of charge. So um, a very low cost is very important to, um, to, to acquire broad-based broad support. And so we have created a monetary architecture that is convertible, provides interest-free credit, solves money scarcity, has a mid, uh, hybrid 
uh, money creation um, methodology because most is uh, created by mutual credit, but we also uh, print debt-free talent units and sell these for euro if needs be. If so, if, if there is a demand on the, on the exchange and there, nobody is offering uh, talent-based units, the issuing organization can sell them and um, the, the, the euros or dollars that we acquire in this way we use to uh, buy up excess talent when uh, when they are being offered on the exchange. So we put that in what we call the stabilization fund, uh, which helps us to guarantee a high exchange rate for the talent-based unit. Um, so uh, interest-free credit, it solves a bu uh, money scarcity, it always provides abundant money, uh, good money creation process, um, uh, transparent business because um, what we are developing at the moment, it is not really uh, available yet, but it will become very soon available, is a talent monitor. And uh, on that, uh, we will, we, uh, the issuing organization will be able to report online, real time, all the, uh, the necessary and relevant information about the network. So how, many, how much is being turned over, uh, what costs are the, is the issuing t organization taking from the participants, um, what, uh, what are the board members making, etc., etc. So, you know, transparency in a modern monetary system is really key. People want this and uh, they have a right to it and uh, we will be providing that also. Um, so, this is a fully-fledged unit or monetary architecture um, solving basically every monetary problem that you can think of. It is absolutely not overdone, not overstating the case to say that you can run an entire country on it. The software uh, allows it, uh, the monetary architecture allows it. Um, and what we have provided in this way is a, uh, a system that can be uh, implemented at low cost. The system itself is very cheap, it is not free because uh, implementation does um, come with some costs that, that we actually have to make for, for programming, etc. but it's very low cost. And uh, what it allows, entrepreneurial people who are into monetary reform, who see the issues, who see how important it is and how huge this battle of a lifetime against the banks really is, uh, who see uh, the, the, the pressing need for extra liquidity for small and medium businesses in, in the market and uh, to, to solve this, this money scarcity, to solve this plundering uh, in the financial system, uh, to, to allow people to slowly start disconnecting from this ghoulish financial system that we have nowadays. Uh, these people, uh, and there are many out, of, out there, entrepreneurial, energetic people who know what they're doing, um, they no longer have to worry about uh, the kind of money that they are going to offer their clientele, they can now fully focus on the main issue, namely getting people on board, getting people to pay with the units, and um, just create an organization with a mind-blowing success that, that can actually blow a hole in, uh, in the dollar-euro monopoly, because that's what it's all about, and that is what the talent has been uh, designed to do. And if you compare it to the other monetary architectures as we have been doing now, you can clearly see that uh, the talent architecture really addresses every major issue that uh, monetary reformers in the complementary uh, currency business have been facing over, over the last decades now. So I hope that this elucidates what the talent is really all about and how it works. And um, if there are any questions, uh, please leave them in the comments and we will discuss them because um, there are no secrets. And um, if you are interested in, uh, in perhaps starting your own unit, if you have plans in that direction, seriously consider the, uh, the talent because uh, personally, I know a little bit about these issues. I'm, I'm, I'm very convinced that this is... Uh, the way forward for, for anybody with plans in, the, in that direction. So, um, unless you have a better plan, but uh, I would like to hear about it because uh, I will come on board with you because it, what it's really all about is it's all about the talent. It is about finding, solving the riddle of banking, solving the riddle of an interest-free econ uh, economy and 
my proposal is one if there are better than uh, that they succeed because there is only one competitor and that is the banking cartel thank you so much for watching